Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And welcome to these next sessions with Sheikh Shomali, inshallah. The, they'll, alaykum salam. Inshallah, there'll be ten, sec, ten sessions on aqaid, uh, two sessions on each one. So without further ado, if you'd invite, if I'd like to invite Sheikh Shomali to give the first of the aqaid lectures. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Salawat. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا ونبينا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين لا سيما بقية الله في الأرضين أجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف وجعلنا من أعوانه وأنصاره وشيئته إن شاء الله إن شاء الله we are going to talk in this new series السلام عليكم عن أقائد but uh, we have to be very brief because we are supposed to finish this in 10 sessions so we cannot go into many details but إن شاء الله I try to address the major issues related to each of usul ad or principles of religion. I have always had the idea that we need to address the issue of aqaid in our gatherings on a regular basis. And I think at least in every three, four years, a very good review of Aqaid must be done. Because this is the most important part of our faith. But unfortunately, we don't have that much you know, opportunity to talk about it in Ramadan or Muharram or you know Ashra or other uh, occasions salam alaikum there are certain topics that we need to address and there is never time to address the issue of aqaid so what happened is that people through different lectures from different people uh, get some ideas some bits and pieces but they never have chance to have a systematic study of aqaid except maybe a little for example in madrasa or you know other places so it's very important that if we plan in the way that every 3 4 years we review aqaid and we take into account also the new issues which arise anyway as you know the Major beliefs among Muslims and even among people of other Abrahamic faith is the same. That is the belief in unity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the belief in prophethood and the belief in resurrection. The fact that there is only one creator and we are all created by him and out of his mercy and wisdom he provides us with extra guidance through revelation so he has sent prophets and that there would be an eternal love life after resurrection and we would be accountable for what we have done and if we have acted and believed properly we would have happiness or salvation this is something which is shared by all followers of abrahamic faith and muslims whether Sunni or Shia believe the same things. We have one more thing to add, and that is to believe in the prophethood of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam as the last prophet, after whom there would be no other prophet, no further communication from Allah subhanahu wa taala as 
prophethood. However, when it comes to articulation, there is a difference between Sunni Muslims and Shia Muslims. Normally, Sunni Muslims, when they talk about pillars of faith, they mention something about aqidah and something about practice together. So for example, they say pillars of faith, there are five pillars of faith. You expect them to say, for example, Tawheed, Adl, Nubuvat, Imamat, or or something similar. But what they say is Chalima, which means declaration of faith by bearing witness that is no God but Allah, and that the Prophet Muhammad is his prophet. And then they mention four acts of worship, like Salat, Zakat, Hajj, and fasting. So they say these five are five pillars of faith. We don't disagree on this. We believe in all this. But the way our ulama have been articulating faith is different. They have tried to keep the doctrinal aspect separate from the practical aspect. So this is why we believe in usul ad-din and furu ad-din. So when we say usul ad-din or principles of religion, we only talk about the doctrines. When we talk about furu ad-din, we talk about those things which are derived from those doctrines. So we say we have principles of religion, principles of faith, which include Tawheed, unity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, prophethood, and the belief in resurrection or ma'ad. And in addition to these three, we believe in divine justice and imamate. So these five are five principles of our faith. And then we talk about the practical requirements of faith like fasting, like praying, like almsgiving, like homes, like hajj, like enjoying the good and prohibiting the bad, like struggle for the sake of Allah, which is jihad, like tawalli and tabarri, to make friendship with the people that have friendship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to disassociate yourself from the people who are enemies of Allah. And these 10 are taken as furu or din or branches of faith. And I personally prefer this one, not because I am a Shia, because as a, a student of theology and philosophy, I think this makes more sense to separate the doctrinal aspect from the practical aspect. It makes it much easier to understand. We are talking about the first part, and that is about principles of faith. And as you know, sometimes our ulama distinguish between usul al-din and usul al-mazhab, between principles of Islam and principles of Shi Islam, the school of Ahlul Bayt. So we say Tawheed and prophethood and resurrection, these three are usul al-din, principles of religion, which are shared by all Muslims and as I said, even by Jews, by Christians. And then in addition to these three, we have two more, and that is to believe in divine justice, in the way that inshallah we will explain, and to believe in imamate. And these five are usul al-masab. These are principles of our faith or denomination, principles of Shi Islam. Okay, so what inshallah we are going to talk about in this series is we are going to talk about these five. About Tawheed, about divine justice, about prophethood, about imamate, and about resurrection, inshallah. But before I start talking about Tawheed, I should say that as far as I know, there is no hadith, there is no nothing special from Ma'sum which says that these five are principles of our faith. This is mostly something which has been developed historically because through ages many controversial issues arose among Muslims and the followers of Ahlul Bayt 
to distinguish their position, they focused on these principles. For example, inshallah, when we talk about justice, inshallah, I will explain why they focused on the issue of justice. Although all Muslims believe Allah is just. There is no Muslim who says Allah is not just. But the way that justice is understood is very different. So our ulama have chosen the issue of justice as very important factor in forming our identity as a follower of the school of Ahlul Bayt. Or for example, imamate, which is something that if you study books on Kalam, you find that all Muslims, except Khawarij, they believe in imamate. All Muslims, they believe in imamate. But the way we understand imamate is different from the way that other Muslims understand imamate. So, our ulama have articulated our doctrinal identity by stressing on five points to the extent that whoever believes in these five can be considered as a Shia. To believe in Tawheed, in divine justice, prophethood, imamat, and resurrection or ma'at. If someone believes in some of these, so he's not a full-fledged Shia. Something similar, similar was adopted by the Mu'tazilite theologians who are somehow close to us in being rational, but they have also some differences. They also chose five principles as their own doctrinal you know, foundations. For example, they also stress on Tawheed, they also stress on justice, Salaam Alaikum. But then they have some other things. For example, they have Amr al-Ma'roof and Nahyan al-Munkar as one of their principles. Because this was something which was very important for them to say that to enjoy the good, you can sometimes resort to the force. So to stress on this, they made this as one of their principles of religion. Or for example, they had an idea which is known as a status between two status, manzilatun baina manzilatain. Because early, in early Islam, there was a controversy about the people who commit major sin, murtakabul kabira. If someone commits a major sin, is he a Muslim or a kafir, a mu'min or kafir? This was a big debate. Some people thought, the one who commits a major sin becomes kafir, like Khawarij. The Khawarij thought that whoever commits a major sin, for example, if someone doesn't say his prayer, if someone tells lies, he becomes kafir. This was the view of Khawarij. This is why they were easily fighting and killing many, many Muslims, saying that you have become kafir. There were people who were saying that they are mu'min. There were people like Mu'tazilite who said they are neither mu'min nor kafir. What are they? They said this is something in between. Manzilatun bayna manzat. This is something between iman and kufr. But they didn't that much articulate that. Anyway, what I am trying to say is that we must have good idea and good understanding of the history of every school of Islam and the way their doctrines have been articulated. I'm saying the way have been articulated. I know it's the way that their doctrines have been, uh, for example, developed. Because what we believe is the same thing that was believed in the beginning. There is nothing added to that. But the way you articulate, you make it clear, you make it systematic, it's different. So, for us, these five are very important, and historically, these five have been chosen so that it can establish our identity. The first is Tawheed. 
Why Tawheed? Why not the existence of God? Because the existence of God is more fundamental. Because first you must say that there is God, and then you say God is one. But why you start with unity of God? This is because existence of God is not that much considered to be questionable. If you read the Quran, you find that except in very few cases, the emphasis has always been on unity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not on the fact that there is God. There are some cases that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about this, but very, very little. For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Am min am humul This is a rational argument. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, are these people created from nothing or they themselves are creators? If someone doesn't believe in Allah as his creator, so he must choose one of these two options. Either he must say that he has been created from no creator, from nothing, which is impossible. Or to say that I have created myself, I am myself a creator, this is also impossible. You must exist so that you can do something. How can you create yourself without being existent? So very simply, very rationally, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rejects any idea that someone may say that I have come into existence without being created. Or in another verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Afillahi shakun fatar as wal ars. Is there any doubt about Allah, the creator of heavens and this earth? So Allah takes it very obvious that He exists. And this is because deep inside every person there is an innate knowledge about God. Although this innate knowledge may not be that much active, in some people may be passive, but in certain circumstances, this can become very active. For example, when we are faced with dangers, with threats, when our hope of being saved by anyone other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is lost, then all of a sudden, we see that we attend to someone who can save us. As you famous hadith from Imam Sadiq alayhi salam suggests that a person went to Imam Sadiq alayhi salam and said, How can I know that God exists? And Imam alayhi salam asked him, Have you ever been on board in ship, for example, you know, traveling on uh, ship or boat? He said, Yes. Imam said, Has ever been very critical situation, seeing that you are going to die, you are going to sink, you cannot save yourself. He said, yes. Imam said, in that particular time, did it come to you that there is someone who can save you? He said, yes. Imam said, that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there is this innate knowledge in every human being. There are also rational arguments. There are many arguments for the existence of God. And some Muslim philosophers also have developed very, uh, very nice argument for the existence of God, which does not need anything other than God himself. And this is called Burhan al siddiqin This is the argument of the righteous people. This was first mentioned by Ibn Sina, then further developed by Mullah Sadra, and finally developed by Allama Tabatabai. And they argue from the concept of being that there must be an infinite being.
It's very nice argument, which is one of the novelties of Islamic philosophy. Doesn't have something so in, um, developed in Western philosophy. Anyway, although there are arguments for the existence of God, but according to the Quran, the main emphasis is put on Tawheed, not on the existence of God. Because the existence of God is something not very difficult to understand. Even the pagans in Mecca or you know Arab Peninsula, they didn't deny the existence of God. They believed in God. But they also believed in idols, and they thought that these idols can help them to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As the Quran says, وَمَا نَعْبُدُهُمْ إِلَّا لِيُقَرِّبُونَ إِلَى اللَّهِ الزُّلْفَةِ They were saying that we don't worship these idols except that we want to become closer to Allah. So they thought that by worshipping these idols who have some type of power, some type of deity, they can become closer to main Lord, which is Allah. This is what was their idea. And they thought that Allah has delegated some of his power and authority to different idols. But they knew that he is the creator. And this is why the Quran says, لَإِنْ سَأَلْتَهُمْ مَنْ خَلَقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ If you ask them who has created heavens and earth, لَيَقُولُنَّ خَلَقَهُنَّ الْعَزِيزُ الْعَلِيمُ They would all say that Allah, who is powerful, who is knowledgeable, he has created the heavens and the earth. So the issue of existence of God is not as much emphasized as unity of God is emphasized. So this is one reason why we cho have chosen unity of God as one of our principles. The second thing which is to be added to this is that Tawheed or unity of God in all different aspects that it has, which we will mention inshallah, is very substantial, very fundamental part of our understanding of Islam. Tawheed is not something that we just learn and repeat, you know, that there is no God but Allah, for example. And when we die, you know, when we are asked by angels, you know, who is your Lord? We say, for example, we ha it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is our Lord. No. If we properly understand Tawheed, then it has lots of implications for every aspect of life. If we fully understand and implement Tawheed, all our problems will be solved. There is no problem in the world except it is caused by lack of implementation or understanding or attention to Tawheed. If there is any moral problem, if there is any conflict, if there is any war, it's all because of negligence to understand that there is one Lord for the world who is the most perfect, the most pure, and by submission to him, we can achieve happiness. When we deny consciously or unconsciously Tawheed, then all the problems start. The great Allah Tabatabai in Al-Mizan, he has a beautiful discussion about Tawheed, and he says, as far as we know, before the Quran, there have been two major attitudes among teachers of morality. One was to ask people to be moral, to be pious, to be good, because of reward that they can receive from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
If they want to be happy, if they want to go to heaven, they should be moral. This was the view of prophets, previous scriptures, who were focusing on this idea of receiving reward or refraining yourself from punishment by being a moral person. The second approach is the approach of the people who would stress on the outcomes of the acts. For example, they say, if you are humble, everyone would love you. Everyone would respect you. If you want to be a good, for example, shopkeeper, sell your goods you know, cheaper, be honest, so that you would have more clients, more customers. So they focus on worldly outcomes. The first group focus on the spiritual and the reward. The second focus on worldly outcomes. But Allah Tawai says, the Quran has different view. Although Quran sometimes adopts some of these views, but has something which is special, which is unique. And that is to remind us that you, as a servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you fully implement Tawheed, then you would have happiness for yourself and you would be a beneficial also member for the society. And all the problems would be solved by this. For example, if I am greedy, if I am jealous, if I am fearful, if I am ungrateful, whatever thing you mention, this is because I am not a good mubahid. I am not a person who fully implements Tawheed. Why should I think that by being jealous, I can add to what I have. Or by being greedy, I can have more. While I know that it's only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who gives and takes. And he is the one who decides what is better. Anyway, Tawheed is very important. Whatever I say about Tawheed is not enough. This is why... Imam Raza alayhi salam in the city of Naishabur, you all know this hadith of golden chain, Salsalatul Zahab. When thousands of people gathered and they insisted on saying some hadith for them, so Imam Raza alayhi salam in such a critical time. If he wanted to give one message to the people, what should he choose? He chose this. He said, I heard from my father, and my father from his father, and then finally from the Prophet, وسلم, and Prophet from Jibra'il, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Kalimatu la ilaha illallah hisni. Faman dakhala hisni, amina min azabi. To believe in unity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to believe that there is no one worthy of worship other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is my hest, is like a fortress, like a castle, like a fortress that whoever enters would be saved from Allah's punishment. Kalimatu la ilaha illallah hisni. The Prophet himself used to say to the people, Qulu la ilaha illallah tuflahu. Declare that there is no God other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you would become happy. That's it. You may say, what about the rest? What about nubuwa, what about ma'ad, what about fasting, praying, hajj, all these things, all these details. If you are a good muwahid, all would come. Just accept this and commit yourself to this, then it will bring and generate all other things. Yes. This is why Imam Raza said, Kalimatu la ilaha illallah hisni. Faman dakhala hisni amina min Then, 
Imam moved and again stopped. Maybe because Imam wanted them to realize that this is not part of the hadith which is from the Prophet. Then Imam said, Bishartaha wa shurutaha. Of course, there are conditions and requirements. Wa anamin shurutaha. And I am one of the conditions. To believe in Imam as a person who has been appointed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide you, this is one of the requirements of Tawheed. And one of the requirements of being saved by Tawheed. So you see how far-reaching and how comprehensive is the concept of Tawheed. That even the idea of Imama or Imamate as the English people say, is put and is integrated inside Tawheed. Okay, so Tawheed is very important. Let me give you some idea so that you can reflect and then inshallah in the next session we will go into a further explanation of those ideas. Normally, the scholars divide Tawheed into different aspects. If I want to classify, I can say there are two general types of Tawheed. Something that we need to believe and something that we need to practice. Theoretical Tawheed and practical Tawheed. Theoretical Tawheed involves three things. Tawheed in respect to divine essence. A Tawheed for Zat, or what we say, a Tawheed of Zati. Unity of God in respect to his essence. Which means there is only one God. He has no partner, no parts. Neither he has partner, nor he has any parts. He is simple, simple opposite to compound. Okay? He is simple means he has no parts, and he has no partner. Laisa kamithlihi shay. So this is unity in respect to divine essence. Second, unity in respect to his attributes. At tawhid fa safat or at tawhid safati. What does it mean? It means that Allah subhanahu wa taala's attributes are identical with his essence. His attributes are not accidental are not additional to his essence. Allah's knowledge is not something which has been added to his essence. Allah's power is not something which has come from outside and has been added to his essence. The very same thing which is Allah's knowledge, is Allah's power, is Allah's mercy, is Allah's will, is Allah's love, and all are the same as his essence. So it's one thing from which we can understand different concepts. Okay? So, this is very important part of Tawheed. And inshallah we will talk about it more. And third, Tawheed in respect to divine acts. At Tawheed fil af'al. What does it mean? It means that whatever happens in this world, is an act of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is no one who can do anything in this world except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we do something, this is again created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We can act, we can do something, but all is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All is because of the power that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to us. Like, for example, you know, when you put a key in the lock and you unlock the door, you say that this is the key which is unlocking the door. But this is not the key itself. This is your hand. 
And this is not the only your hand. This is you who is behind all these movements of the hand and the fingers and the key and the lock. So we do, we have some role, but after careful assessment, we find that this is act of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and there is no one who can do anything in this world unless it has been not only permitted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not only been authorized by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but also created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is very important requirement of Tawheed. Okay, these three are all theoretical Tawheed, something that we need to believe. But there is also something that we need to practice, and that is Tawheed in respect to worship. This is something to practice, not only to know. We must not worship anyone other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is Tawheed. This is a Tawheed. Only worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Is it enough just to know this, that we should only worship Allah? No. It's not enough just to know this. We need to practice this. We need to worship only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then each of these can be further detailed. For example, when you say all the acts are created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then it involves a tawheed fil khaliqiyya, that Allah is the only creator. A tawheed fil rububiyya. All these come out of that. Or when we say we can only worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the same is true about obedience. The only one who deserves to be obeyed is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah has created us free. No one can ask me to obey him except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The people who have authority from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like the prophets, like imams, like parents, we obey them. Why? Because Allah has asked us to obey them. Allah has asked us to obey your parents. Even if you are a person who has his own children and grandchildren, still you must obey your father. This is the authority that Allah has given to parents. But if your father asks you to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is automatically losing his, this authority. You don't worship anyone other than Allah, so you don't obey anyone by disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there are some people that I myself may have accepted to obey them. That is something voluntary. For example, we want to organize a society or a community, then we choose someone to be, for example, our director or our president, then we say, okay, we listen to you. But he doesn't have authority as such. This is the authority that we are giving to him. So no one other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has authority from himself. It's only Allah who deserves to be obeyed. Otherwise, we are all free. And this has lots of implications also in political theory of Islam. We are very free people in Islam. It's not that everyone can come in and say, okay, you must obey me. But there are ways and there are techniques to somehow concentrate power somewhere in the way that doesn't conflict with the rights of people. Anyway, the major aspects of Tawheed are these four, and as I said, they may imply other things. I just repeat, and then inshallah in the next session, inshallah we go into further details. So Tawheed in respect to divine essence, which means that he has no part nor partner. Tawheed in respect to divine attributes, which means that all his attributes are identical with each other in existence and identical with his essence, only the concepts are different. Tawheed in respect to divine act, which means that everything which is created is an act of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everything which happens is an act of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is no one other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who can originate anything. It's only Allah. And then Tawheed in worship. You should only worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and nothing else deserves 
our worship. Thank you very much for your attention, and may inshallah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase our knowledge and our commitment. Wa akhiru da'wana and alhamdulillah rabbil alam. The Muslim in the main hall, inshallah.